Welcome to a special webinar brought to you by the AKC Canine Health Foundation Bloat Initiative. Our presenter is Dr. Elizabeth Rosansky, a board-certified specialist in emergency medicine and critical care and professor at the Tufts University Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Rosansky graduated from the University of Illinois College of Veterinary Medicine in 1992, completed an internship at the University of Minnesota, and then a residency in emergency and critical care at the University of Pennsylvania. She is a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care and the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. Since 1996, she has worked at Tufts Veterinary School where she directs the critical care service. In this webinar, Dr. Rosansky explains what every dog owner needs to know about gastric dilatation volvulus or bloat. She will present the signs and treatment options for bloat along with current options for prevention. The AKC Canine Health Foundation Bloat Initiative also includes a significant research effort. CHF would like to extend a special thank you to the champion level sponsors of this initiative. The Collie Health Foundation, the Irish Setter Club of America Foundation, the Greyhound Club of America, and the St. Bernard Club of America and Charitable Foundation. Their extremely generous contributions, along with the support of countless other clubs and individuals, has helped us reach our funding goal so that we can ultimately define the cause of this devastating disease. So what we want to cover today is what is bloat. Dogs are clearly a major member of our families and bloat is one of those diseases that can take a happy family and create devastation within a very, very short order. And that's really the biggest reason we want to talk about bloat today is to get people familiar with what it is, how they can help their specific dog, as well as what's happening and why we think this disease develops. So bloat is known as the, as the kind of password or kind of common language for call it torsion, but this is actually medically incorrect. It's really a dilatation volvulus or twisting of the stomach. And this disease is a surgical emergency in affected dogs. And unfortunately, despite aggressive treatment, up to 20 or 30 percent of affected dogs die. And this is something that we're really working hard to change. What our focus is today, though, is really covering what happens in bloat and what we can really do about that and what you as a dog owner can do to help keep your dog from dying of this disease. So when we think about what causes bloat, probably one of the bigger players is genetics and anatomy. So we know that there's certain breeds of dogs that are very, very overrepresented in the development of bloat. And if you have a breed at risk, it's very, very important to know what's happening with your individual breed. And it's very important to know that there's also variations in specific breeds. There's also a lot of individual dog factors. And these include things like a stressful event. From a veterinary standpoint, one of the things I think about most is boarding kennels, trips away from home, um, fireworks, thunderstorms, those sorts of things that for an individual dog are really peaking out that dog's anxiety level. And what we worry about with that individual dog is that they get into problems developing this condition. Personality is important. We know that dogs that tend to be anxious are more nervous in general, and that's absolutely something that varies within individual breeds as well as within um, certain breeds are certainly slightly more nervous or anxious than other breeds of dogs. And advancing age is also an individual dog factor. First order relatives, so having a parent or a litter mate that's affected, has also been shown to increase the risk. And sometimes this is easy to know, and other times it's harder to know if a, your dog's individual relative was ever affected with bloat. Um, the large breed deep chested dogs that mo are at greatest risk reported most commonly in Great Danes. And in one study, actually, Great Danes had up to a third lifetime risk, so one in three Great Danes could be affected with bloat over the course of their lifetime. German Shepherds are number-wise a very popular breed of dog, and they're very, very overrepresented as well. Um, the Setter, Standard Poodles as a slightly smaller but also deep-chested dog, Bloodhounds, but really we can see it in any breed of dog. Um, and as we look at different breeds of dogs that are affected, we really remember that it can happen in any breed of dog. It's even been reported in cats um, and in ferrets, and every now and then the rare person can develop it as well. And again, first-order relatives, so a very close litter mate, a parent or grandparent, can really increase that risk if that's information that's available. 
We again recognize that our Great Dane friends have up to a 30% lifetime risk. Um, this is just a video of some Great Danes playing in a field. And when we look at these dogs, a lot of dog, a lot of people who have big breed dogs have more than one. This is something where one of these dogs could very well be expected to develop a bloat in its lifetime, and it's something that we'd really want to work hard to prevent. So what happens in bloat? I want to go through what happens in the disease, what's happening for our patients, what are our clinical signs and treatment, how do we prevent it, and then a little bit about research that's happening because, again, this is a huge focus of, of research to veterinary practitioners, to the emergency clinicians, and certainly to the dog owners um, because it's a disease that we'd like to be able to prevent if we could. So in bloat, what happens is the stomach fills with air and then rotates on its axis. And so it kind of twists off both the inflow to the stomach from the esophagus and the outflow to the stomach through the duodenum. So this food normally should come down the esophagus, go through the stomach, begin digestion there, and then pass easily out into the duodenum where digestion further continues to occur. And in bloat, the stomach fills with air and twists, and then there's additional air production in the stomach. So basically, the stomach is acting almost as a fermentation chamber and more gas is being formed within the stomach. The stomach, again, continues to enlarge with air, and this isn't just room air, it's air that's forming within the digestion process, and this increasing distension actually worsens the obstruction. What can happen with this is the blood flow is cut off to areas of the stomach, um, and as the stomach twists, it can also pull the spleen with it. Um, just anatomically, the spleen is kind of connected to the stomach, and as it flips over, the blood supply to the spleen can be damaged as well. And we'll see areas in some dogs of the stomach that can actually die from lack of blood flow, and we can actually see in, um, an entire stomach dying from this if it's left untreated for too long of a time period. So I wanted to introduce you to Honey. So Honey's, um, as you can see, a, a much-loved English setter, and she's here recovering from her bloat. And I want to tell you a little bit about what happened with Honey, because this is the kind of story that can be really hard for any owner, any dog lover anywhere. So as you can see, Honey's a lovely English setter. Um, she developed bloat at home shortly after a new puppy was introduced. She was considered a calm, happy dog, a very good-natured dog, and whether or not the puppy had anything to do with it, it's not really clear, but certainly she became very sick after the puppy came into the household. She went to an emergency clinic where she was promptly treated. Um, she had immediate surgery, which is again really the standard of care for this disease, but she had a slow and incomplete recovery. She came to us as a tertiary care hospital for ongoing support, and we identified that she had fluid in her chest cavity, so she had something called a pyothorax, probably from fluid leaking in across her diaphragm, which is that muscle that separates the chest and the abdomen, and she had ongoing devitalized or dead pieces of her stomach with mm -hmm. infection in her abdomen that was contributing to why she felt so bad. And again, the emergency clinic did a wonderful job. Honey is a very loved dog, but ended up having a very severe complicated course. And we mention her because this is the kind of nightmare that we all think about. So Honey, over the clinical course, this is her as she was thinking about going home. She was hospitalized for about two weeks. You can see that she's set here to go running as soon as she gets home. She ended up having another operation. She had much treatment for sepsis or generalized infection in her body. She underwent nutritional support because she really just didn't feel like eating for a little while, and a lot of TLC, certainly by her family, but also by all the nurses and doctors in our hospital. Um, and so again, when we think about Honey, this is the kind of dog that represents you know, the horrible clinical course that can accompany bloat. Some dogs that have bloat go home very, very quickly, but Honey kind of represents one of the outliers of a dog that had a very tough go of it, despite having being very well loved and having a very good course. So how do you recognize bloat at home? This is probably the biggest thing to recognize. When I think about talking to dog families, the first thing that I think about is knowing your breed. Um, and so purebred dogs are wonderful. Many people have mixed breed dogs that are identified as part shepherd or part Dane or any of those sorts of things. So recognizing that in, if you have a deep chested or big breed dog, these dogs are going to be at risk of bloat. So that's the first step. The Clinically, what we see is they're restless. They don't want to settle down. Um, they'll lay down for a minute. Dogs that are well 
trained, you send them to their bed, they'll lay down, they'll get up, they're restless, they just can't settle, they'll try to retch and they'll unproductively vomit, they just won't really settle down, they're up and down, they, you let them out in the yard, you think maybe they're having some GI upset, they'll come back in, they're just not any better, they're nauseous, they have a lot of drool, um, they may have a distended abdomen, that's something that we would classically think would happen, and certainly some families can recognize this, but some of our very deep chested dogs, some of our setters, for example, their stomach actually is underneath their rib cage, so you can't actually palpate that. If you feel it, um, if you identify a dog that has a distended abdomen, that's certainly an absolute thing to jump on, but I just want to point out that it's really the restlessness, difficulty settling, nausea and drooling that's really going to point you that something's going on. And I think, again, most of our dog families recognize this, but kind of a key point here is this is not something to sleep on. This is not something to see how the dog might look in the morning. And again, as a good emergency doctor, one of the things I always think about is it's really important to have a sense of what do you do in an emergency. And I think most um, pet owners know if their veterinarian is open and what the closest emergency clinic is. But because this is often a disease of stress or associated with travel, if you're visiting your relatives, if you're doing something else, you're taking the dog to a show or an event, know where those emergency clinics are in the area and have a sense of how to get there. And again, that might be a little bit overkill, but really this is the type of disease that 10 or 15 minutes can make a difference in outcome. So knowing how to act and where to act, particularly when you're away from home, can be really helpful. Um, when we think about home care, a lot of things we talk about with emergency medicine, people want to know, is there something I can try at home? And I think we'll come back to bloat kits later in this, in this webinar, but really there's nothing practical that's advised. Urgent veterinary care is really going to be your best bet. And again, we'll circle back a little bit later. In some cases, if you're very far away from any veterinary care or you're having a lot of struggles getting somewhere, bad weather, something like that, there may be some other options, but really this is not a disease that you can try Maalox or Gas-X and expect that it's going to make a big difference. Again, I'd much rather have a dog come in and say, I'm worried that he has bloat. Um, we take a radiograph and do an exam and identify the dog's not bloated and send them home rather than have somebody try to treat him at home or um, because it's just a disease that requires surgery. It's not going to be something you can do at home. Um, home triage. Again, this is true for bloat, but it's also true for really any other condition that you're thinking about. When we look at our patients having a hard time, what we're looking for is we're looking for abnormalities with the heart, brain, or lungs. So things that you can do if you're comfortable with is start to learn what your dog's resting heart rate is. You can feel the pulses kind of in their inner thigh or actually by feeling their heart, which is right behind where their elbow is. They should be alert and oriented, and they should be breathing comfortably. You can look at their gum color, those sorts of things to give you a sense for what's happening. What are we going to do at the hospital is if um, many places you can potentially call ahead and say, I think I might have a dog with bloat, and that can be helpful. But again, in general, if you can't get through or you're not sure, just show up. We're always happy to help out in these situations. The assessment at the hospital is going to include initial stabilization. And again, optimizing these patients for surgery really improves outcome. We want to establish and confirm diagnosis, get them into surgery, get them through surgery, and then get them home as quickly as possible and when we're sure that they're going to be stable. When we talk about stabilizing, we're evaluating for shock. This is a picture of a dog with very, very pale gums. And again, I really encourage you to look at your own dog's gums color at home and get a sense for what's normal for them. Some breeds of dogs, the Red Dobies and Weimaraners, have a little bit different color gums than other breeds of dogs. So know what your dog's gums look like. This is clearly a dog that's very, very pale. We're going to evaluate dogs when they appear in the hospital for heart rate. A big breed dog's heart rate in the hospital typically shouldn't be above 120 beats per minute. Dogs with bloat are often around 180 or 200. Color, the mucous membrane color, the gum color. Abdominal palpation for a distended stomach, or sometimes we can feel the spleen. And again, this is going to be in our deep chested dogs, our setters, our, our shepherds, where their stomach may have twisted inside their stomach or inside their rib cage, and we don't feel the stomach, but we can actually feel a large mass in the abdomen, which is the spleen. We're going to volume resuscitate the dog, so we're going to give them an IV catheter, typically in the front leg, because it's going to be the return of blood from the back legs are going to be impeded by this dilated stomach. So we're going to put a lot of fluids into the front legs, and we're going to control pain. These are do This is absolutely a painful condition, but we know that we need to get them resuscitated with some fluids and then treat their pain. 
we're going to confirm a diagnosis. What we're going to be looking for is we're going to be looking for an enlarged spleen, which you can see on some radiographs, and then this classic right lateral radiograph. And we often teach our students things like double bubble, the dog's in trouble. And so you can see this orange line that's pointing to the compartmentalization of the stomach or how the stomach is twisted on itself. In this specific dog, we can't see the spleen but sometimes that's visible on the lower bit of the radiograph. And so again, as we look for those sorts of things, that's what we're, we're looking to see. So it's a very straightforward diagnosis to confirm, and it's something that we want to know exactly what we're dealing with. Other conditions can certainly mimic bloat, and I, my background as an ER doctor still encourages us to bring these dogs in. Just don't know what you're dealing with at home. Um, I don't live very far from the hospital that I work at, and if my dogs have these signs, I come in to figure out what's happening. It's just not something that's easy to play phone triage or home guessing of what's happening. But the other conditions that we can think about are food bloat, um, where a dog may just eat a lot of food and have basically the Thanksgiving dinner sort of appearance to their stomach. Gas bloat, where their stomach can fill with gas but not twist, something stuck in the esophagus, or something else making the belly big. So food bloat, this is a radiograph, and if you think back, comparing it to that radiograph that we saw where the stomach was filled with air, and so air is going to look dark, just like what's outside of the patient. In this dog's stomach, what we can see is that there's basically a lot of granular material, which is food, um, filling up the stomach. And this will often happen if dogs eat a bag of kibble or they eat a whole lot of um, something that they shouldn't get into the garbage. It's common retrievers, probably Labradors are our biggest offenders in this category, but really any breed of dog can eat more than they should, and they'll feel distended, they'll feel uncomfortable, and these are dogs that can clinically look like they're having a, a torsion or a GDV, but really they're just having a lot of food in their stomach, and this is something that will pass over time. Um, treatment of food bloat is really basically supportive. Fluids maybe to help them pass the food through there, um, just because if they eat 10 pounds of dry food, and they'll eat sometimes that much, it's really their stomach is filled with dry, dry kibble, and it, they'll certainly digest that over time, but it can take a little bit longer, and so some fluids may help with that. Maybe a little bit of pain medicine if they're very uncomfortable, walking them freely, encouraging them to drink, and these guys will recover pretty quickly. Uh, episode of food, food bloat doesn't really have any clinical relevance to a later episode of um, GDV. It's it's not going to be something that we worry that this dog is going to be more likely to have a bloat in the future. It is something that tells us to keep the food away from the dog, but it's not something that's going to have medical ramifications. Gas bloat, on the other hand, is a condition where the dog will stomach will distend. Again, absolutely just 100% radiographically looking like the stomach is filled with air. And you can see on this dog, again, this is a right lateral radiograph, the gas-filled round structure in the abdomen is the stomach, but the stomach itself isn't twisted, it's just filled with air. Um, and we can see this happening in dogs that are, we, we do worry that these dogs are more likely to develop a bloat in the future. There's also a weird condition that we worry about that's something that's called a 360-degree bobulus. And what this is is a condition where the stomach rotates all the way around on its axis. And so it's back to a normal anatomic location, but it's something that is completely blocked. And so that's something that we can distinguish by looking at physical exam findings on the jog, feeling that large spleen, and sometimes by some other x-ray views. These dogs will get distended with gas, we think, along the same pathways as a kind of a pre-GDV or gastric dilatation bobbly this dog will do. We can also see dogs with gas-filled stomachs if they have an upper airway obstruction and they're swallowing a lot of air, and that's something that we term aerophasia. Treatment of gas bloat is to decompress these dogs because if you think about it, your stomach, if your stomach is very, very filled with air, as a natural response, what a dog should do is bloat or to burp and get that gas out of there so belch and relieve that obstruction. So if they're not belching, if they're not getting that gas out of there, we'll actually decompress them by passing a small stomach tube or putting a little needle into their stomach. And this is a condition that we worry is a very major warning sign for future bloat or for future GDB. So while we hit it, this is not an emergency need to go to surgery, a dog that's had a gas bloat is a dog that we worry is at much greater risk of developing a future GDB, and so we treat those as such. 
Um, other things that we can see is esophageal foreign bodies, again, for things that cause drooling and reluctance to settle. Um, this is more common in our terrier friends. The Westies in particular are very overrepresented, but they'll eat a bone of some sort or a, a squeaky toy or a rawhide, and they swallow something that's just a little bit too big to go down, and it gets stuck in their esophagus and causes the same sort of discomfort drooling, reluctance to settle, um, and you're going to identify this on radiographs, and you're going to identify that their stomach doesn't look um, like it's filled with air. Um, the last category of things that we distinguish bloat from is something termed ascites or free fluid in the abdomen, and this is something that we'll see in congestive heart failure. Um, Dobermans are certainly represented in congestive heart failure. We can also see cancer or hemorrhage causing those sorts of things, causing a fluid-filled stomach. Identifying ascites, you can feel it on palpation sometimes. You can feel that the abdomen inside it feels tense like a drum. So our dogs with bloat will almost feel like, um, really like a drum because it's their stomach is stretched over a, a bunch of air. Dogs with fluid in their abdomens feels a little more squishy. Um, they feel like kind of sloshing around. You can identify it with ultrasound. This is an ultrasound image on the right-hand side of the screen, and those dark areas are fluid in between organs, and treatment of the ascites or what we're going to do for that really depends on the cause. And this is something that probably in our hospital two or three times a year we'll have a dog that presents for concern for bloat, um, and then we actually identify that they have fluid in their abdomen instead. So again, something to look for at home, but it's not something where it's the same disease. It's just figuring out for sure what's happening. After we confirm a diagnosis of bloat, or GDB, we're going to continue resuscitation. Again, how we're doing that is with our right lateral radiograph. We're going to continue fluid resuscitating these dogs in order to make their volume status better. And what that really means is making sure they have enough intervascular volume, so enough um, blood in their system to deliver um, oxygen to all their vital organs, and then we're also going to decompress them, which means getting that air out of their stomach, which improves their circulation. And we can do this one of two ways. The first is something called tropurization, where we'll put a needle into their stomach and release air. And the second is by passing a tube under anesthesia. Um, many years ago, we used to pass these tubes awake, um, and we've identified that the dogs are really uncomfortable with it. And more importantly, it can, uh, well, certainly their comfort is important, but it can also have some negative cardiovascular side effects to do that, so now we pass our tubes under anesthesia. Um, prompt surgical exploration is the next step, and this is considered a surgical emergency. Um, we know that duration of torsion or GDB can influence outcome, and the actual how long do you have is really an unknown question. We identify that dogs that have been bloated overnight, so people say, oh, you know, the dog is really restless at night, so I stuck them out in the backyard or in the kennel and I checked on them at 6 in the morning. Those are often the dogs that we find don't make it through surgery, so duration is certainly important. But on the other hand, we also recognize that these dogs need some stabilization before surgery um, and try to get them as stable as we possibly can with fluids first. Generally, we try to get a dog with this disease after identification into the operating room within about an hour to an hour and a half of after presentation. So that's considered about the ideal amount of time to get them as good as we possibly can um, and not have the stomach under pressure for too long. So again, prompt, not immediate, but not the next morning either. Our goals at surgery are to put the stomach back in position, um, assess for dead areas of the stomach, look at the screen and look at other organs. Most often dogs with bloat or GDB don't have any other disease in their mm -hmm. abdomen, but certainly they could potentially have something where they have a cancer somewhere, or they have a splenic mass, or they have bladder stones, or sometimes they'll have a foreign object in their stomach. So we look at everything, and then we perform a gastropexy or tacking where we'll actually stitch the stomach to the side of the body wall to prevent this from recurring. What we can find at surgery, again, is gastric necrosis, so pieces of dead stomach. We can, again, find our spleen it can be twisted, and when that spleen is twisted, it can sometimes die, and we may need to remove the spleen. And again, as we mentioned, we can find cancer somewhere, or we could find a foreign object. Dogs that eat a lot of stuff sometimes can, it may be that foreign objects can trigger this.
This is a picture, I apologize for being kind of graphic, um, and this is a picture of a, a dead stomach, and you can see kind of near the bottom right a hole in the stomach, and this was a stomach that had actually already ruptured on its own before we got the dog to surgery. And so the red areas, the kind of ready purple areas in the surgeon's hands are also dead areas of the stomach, um, and that's a tissue area that we have to remove, but that gray area with the hole in the middle is an area of the stomach that already ruptured. And so this is a kind of dog that would have a much harder time recovering from surgery, and this is the dog that we really worry about, could have a lot of complications. Um, with the gastric necrosis, like we saw in that picture, we will remove that dead tissue. This does obviously mm -hmm. increase the cost of surgery. We'll use the human uh, staplers for that. So staplers designed for use in people, and the cartridges for those are typically fairly expensive. You can sometimes also hand sew um, the tissue back together, but that can increase anesthesia time. Um, this can increase the risk of death postoperatively. Some dogs, while they can live with quite small stomachs with a large gastric resection or removal of a lot of the stomach, can have a higher chance of not recovering well. And in some rare cases at surgery, if the whole stomach is dead, we end up euthanizing dogs in surgery due to the extent of the gastric necrosis because we really worry that these dogs aren't going to have a good quality of life, that they're not going to be able to do well afterwards. So this is a really big break point, and this is one of the big areas where we really encourage people to bring their dogs in very quickly. Recovery for the average dog is typically two to three days in the hospital after surgery. During this time period, they're having IV fluids, pain medications, usually perioperative antibiotics. We know it's not an infectious disease, but because they're shocky, they're at higher risk of developing an infection somewhere, so we'll keep, often keep them on antibiotics at least for a couple of days. Anti-nausea medicines, encouraging them to eat again. And we watch for abnormal um, heartbeats. They'll have some ectopy or abnormal heart rhythms, and these can sometimes be serious, particularly in dogs that have a pre-existing heart disease like Doberman's. Recovery at home. This is a major abdominal surgery for the dogs. Um, they usually take a couple of weeks at home to get completely back to normal. They're going to have some rest, um, limited exercise as their incision is healing, encouraging them to eat till they get their appetite back, and often we'll recommend frequent small amounts of bland food um, every three to four hours for the first day or two, and then kind of gradually transitioning back to their regular diet. Typically, they're fully recovered from this within about two weeks, um, but it can sometimes take a little bit longer. And for people who have active show dogs or um, performance dogs, complete recovery can take longer. They'll have lost some muscle mass associated with rest, and they can also, certainly if they're a coated breed, it can take a little while for their fur coat to grow back to show characteristics. Um, so is there anything we can do? It's a disease that we know about 80% of the dogs that are presented to the hospital and are treated will survive, but that's still not really high enough. The other thing that we see in the emergency service is sometimes dogs, when they're identified with this, this disease, um, it's not an appropriate step for their family to go ahead with supporting surgery, whether that's through the dog has other diseases, so severe arthritis or cancer or something else, or if the dog or simply the costs associated with surgery. So as you might guess, this can be an expensive undertaking, and again, depending a lot on where you are in the country, but it certainly can easily reach into the thousands of dollars for 24 hours our care, and so that's something really important to consider as well. So we think a lot about is there anything you can do to prevent bloat. Um, things to think about are lifestyle, surgical things, and pet insurance, and these are areas to kind of think about separately. From a lifestyle standing point, um, we people would love a way, and I agree I would love a way for this, is is there some way we could do something with feeding habits? Um, and so people have looked at a variety of these different things and it's relatively small groups of dogs, but it, um, we used to think that big meals might make the stomach so distended that it would flip over. Now we identify that smaller and more frequent meals may be easier for the dog for some other reasons, but probably aren't going to matter from a standpoint of bloat. Exercise after eating probably doesn't matter. Now, if you're going to go work a dog very, very hard after, after eating, that's probably not a good plan for a variety of reasons. But strictly from a bloat standpoint, eating dinner and then playing in the backyard has not been shown to be a risk. Larger food size, so not pulverized food, may be protective although most of the large breed dogs will eat kibble, and so this is less of a concern. And feeding from a height, sometimes people have thought if we feed them from a height, that will help. Does not, that doesn't appear to matter. 
So again, this is, I recognize not the great news because you're hoping to say, oh, is there something I can specifically do to keep this from happening? Um, and there's not from a feeding standpoint. Um, if there's dogs that are nervous or, or stressful, I think this is something that is important. We know that anxious dogs will have higher risks. They may swallow a little more air. If you're nervous, you may not have the same motility, meaning stomach contents may not move through your GI tract as fast. So it may be that these dogs have higher risks. GI ex exercise may be a little bit beneficial, promoting GI motility. Probably most importantly is recognizing that some dogs may not tolerate boarding or being at unfamiliar locations as well as others. And then recognizing what to do if you're out of town, how to make sure people know exactly what you're up against. When we think of boarding kennels, again, as my background as an ER doctor, dogs boarding at a, a boarding at a boarding kennel is one of the biggest disasters we can have because sometimes people are unreachable. And certainly now most everyone has a cell phone, but sometimes it's still hard to reach people. So making sure that a kennel can reach you or an authorized delegate for decisions regarding surgery is important because sometimes kennels haven't talked to people about that. And so I want people to be proactive and say, you know, certainly if my dog develops bloat, I would like him you to take him to this hospital. I'd like him to have an operation, and here's how you can reach me, or here's how you can reach my sister who can also make decisions, or my co-owner, or any of those sorts of things. Um, but again, this is from an emergency vet standpoint, very frustrating not to be able to reach somebody when we have a dog that has something that's fixable. I also want to talk about preventative surgery, and this is going to be something that's really important from for the individual dog. And so this is, uh, while we know at surgery for dogs that have GDB, we will do a tacking surgery or a gastropexy where we'll basically stitch the stomach to the lining of the of the inside of the abdomen to keep it from flipping again. We can also do this as preventative surgery. And as a disease um, to be prevented, this is something that's very, very helpful. It's a very effective and very safe surgery to prevent this. It doesn't prevent the gas distension. They can still bloat, but they really won't twist. They won't develop this fobulus if their stomach is tapped. So it's a really a big, important thing to consider. You can do a preventive gastropexy a couple of ways. You can do it laparoscopically, or you can do it as an open surgical procedure. Um, and to really, I want to encourage people to think about this for those breeds of dogs at risk in particular. This is a picture of doing it laparoscopically, and so this is similar to what people would have done. Um, they're the little purple line on the dog's abdomen. So to orient you, the dog is laying on his back. Um, and again, this is very similar, done in the OR, um, an operating room, just like a human procedure would be done. But there's really small little incisions where using a camera, we can reach in, find the stomach, and then using that, make a small incision and stitch the stomach to the side of the body in a good anatomic location. This is a very, very fast recovery time. This can be coupled with uh, ovariectomy or some other procedures if that's a goal, um, but it's a very simple, very straightforward, very rapid recovery, um, and it's done in many, many places throughout the country um, and is a very in growing popular technique. Um, again, this is the type of incision you have. You have a couple little small incisions, but nothing really big, nothing that's going to be a hard recovery for the dog. Um, you can also do the surgery open, and this is commonly done combined with the spay, particularly for show dogs that are at the end of their breeding career. They're getting spayed. They're in an at-risk breed. Having them pexied at the same time or tacked at the same time is a very good idea. Also in other abdominal surgeries, we will think about doing this. We in fact just had a standard poodle this last weekend that had a big squeaker toy in the stomach and he needed an operation to remove that. And at the same point, we did a gastrotacking surgery, a gastropexy, in order to keep him from developing bloat in the future. You can also do it as an isolated surgical procedure, and this is something that is pretty straightforward to do. It's a much, much more rapid recovery than with the standard bloat surgery if it's a dog that's actually had a GDV where they have all of the biochemical and perfusion complications. This is a really quick recovery for them. Uh, so again, gastropexy is the most effective technique to prevent bloat in the individual dog. Now, um, when you think about it, it doesn't address why bloat develops. It doesn't do anything for the genetics. But for that individual dog, this is the way to prevent the disease until, as scientists, we can get on top of why it's happening or we can identify the genetic causes and get it not to show up in dogs. For the individual dog, a preventive gastropexy mm -hmm. is really an important way to go. The 
questions come up is what's the dog's actual, actual, actual me, relative risk in its lifetime, and that's hard to predict. For Danes, for sure, this is a very high risk um, sort of disease, so Great Danes, Shepherds, Setters, Standard Poodles um, are very, very highly represented, and these are dogs I really think strongly about doing a gastropexy in. In individual dogs of different breeds, if they tend to be specifically deep chested, so have a very long chest in relation to the width of their chest, or if we know they have a relative that's had a GBV, that's going to be a very high risk of bloat as well, and so that's a dog I'd strongly consider in additionally. So again, thinking about this, work with your um, colleagues as far as other people in the, if you're sh in the show dog world, making sure you know about the family lines. If you have an individual dog owner, talk to your breeder, talk to your veterinarian about your individual dog's risk. But for the individual dog, a preventative gastropexy is by far the way to go to keep this disease from happening. Um, the other thing to think about is pet insurance. And again, this is everybody has a different financial status or what they're comfortable with. But costs associated with surgical therapy for GDV are high, and this is something that's not a planned cost. Um, so depending on your financial situation, considering pet insurance can be really a helpful way to go. A lot of them will have a catastrophic clause, and so it can be relatively low cost, really only pick up had it um, at the really high-end thing. So this can absolutely be something that can be life-saving. And cost can sometimes result in euthanasia of a dog with otherwise a good prognosis. And we always hate, as veterinarians, that money comes into it. Um, and it's, to me, it's appealing to be able to avoid adding the financial stress to times of an emotional stressful time. So consider this, again, depending on your financial status um, and what you're comfortable with, but it can be a very reasonable plan to be thinking about as something that's worth doing. Um, other things to kind of finish up a little bit, what are some special scenarios? I want to talk about bloat kits. I want to talk about some blood markers because I think that's one of the areas that sometimes people read about and it's always worth thinking about those things, trying to think about what might be happening um, or what are those things that might be going on. Um, but first talking about bloat kits. So these will be marketed pretty widely on the internet um, and these are also absolutely something that different breed clubs recommend. And what these are either come as a stomach tube, um, so basically a, usually they're a full tube, so a tube that's designed for use in a small horse, baby horse, or it can be a large bore needle and kit like that. And the rationale for this is that if you can pass a tube or you can decompress the stomach, you'll buy yourself a little bit more time. And from, again, my bias as an emergency doctor, these are not going to be as helpful if you're anywhere close to a veterinarian. Um, so if you're somewhere and you're um, on the field and you're in um, you know, a very rural part of, say, northern Maine and you're two hours from the local emergency clinic and it's, it's two in the morning, thinking about a bloat kit might be a very reasonable thing to think about. Um, on the other hand, if you're 20 minutes from an emergency clinic or you're going to call your friend to come over and have them help you with a bloat kit, you're much better off going to a veterinarian. And again, the rationale for that is the fluids that we give these dogs mm -hmm. at the same time. This is not a disease where you just need to decompress the stomach. It's a condition where you actually need to put the stomach back surgically and in doing so also provide them with some volume support. So again, the general recommendation is to stay away from bloat kits. But but I also recognize that not everybody is always within a 20-minute drive of a veterinarian or a half an hour drive. And so depending on where you're at, um, it may be something to consider. But again, talk to your own veterinarian about that. And I absolutely love the idea of dogs going on vacations or going on trips. But if they do that, you want to be able to think very clearly for what are we doing as far as um, where is our closest vet and do we need to have these sorts of things here. This is a, not the best home use of home first aid. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is a um, biomarker called lactate. And a lot of people are familiar with lactate from human medical use. And so we talk about if you exercise, you might reach your lactate threshold. Um, blood lactate is, shows up in the blood when a patient is shocky. So if they're having ineffective oxygen delivery to the tissues, their blood lactate will go up. And it's measured on a little handheld kit, similar to glucometer for people who are diabetic or you know people who are diabetic. So just a drop of blood can tell you if the patient is in shock. And we certainly use this clinically for a variety of diseases. And about uh, maybe about 14, 15 years ago, there was a really nice study that came out of the University of Pennsylvania 
that talked about high lactate values, a value of less than two is normal, and they identified that dogs that had a value of greater than six were most commonly associated with gastric necrosis um, and subsequent death in this group of dogs. And what we want to mention here is that this somehow got into some of the emergency clinics and some of the veterinary literature that if your dog had a lactate of greater than six, it wasn't going to survive. And I just want to reiterate that that's not true. Lactate is a great marker, but it doesn't tell you if an individual dog is going to do okay or not. It just gives you a group population. So if your veterinarian uses lactate and says, oh, the lactate's really high, that does tell you that your dog has shock, but it doesn't tell you that it's not worth treating the dog or that he's not going to survive that. So keep that in mind. Um, other things to think about, again, are could the dog have something else associated with bloat? And again, even in older dogs, this is uncommon. This is just something that happens. We'll see some dogs with rare intestinal masses, so they can have a mass that prevents stuff from leaving the stomach, but that's an uncommon spot for the dog to have a tumor, but we can sometimes see that. We can sometimes see dogs that have concurrent heart disease that might make anesthesia a little bit riskier. But again, um, if you look at euthanizing the dog, that's clearly what results in a worse outcome, outcome than attempting surgery. So cardiac disease may play a role in stabilization and may affect survival, but certainly it's still very reasonable to treat these dogs with this. And again, we recognize that advanced age is a risk for development of bloat, but it's not a specific disease. So when you look at if your 12-year-old dog has a bloat, is it worth having that dog have surgery? It really depends on the dog's quality of life beforehand. If this was a dog that was doing pretty well, maybe a little bit of arthritis, but otherwise good spirits, you can absolutely expect that that dog will do well. And in our hospital, I think the oldest dog that we operated was an 18-year-old shepherd, or they said she was 18, and she did great. So age is not a risk factor, but underlying comorbidity is. So if you have a dog that has horrible arthritis, really bad heart disease, bad kidney disease, that's a dog that might have a much harder time recovering. But simply age is not a reason not to pursue surgery. Um, and so this is going to kind of conclude my presentation. I'm certainly always happy to answer any questions, but when we think about what to do for dogs with bloat, really kind of a summary of what I want to think about is looking at recognizing the disease. So I want pet owners and pet families to recognize what bloat happens, recognize dogs that are potentially at risk. These are my two dogs. They're both setters and they're both pexy without having a bloat ever because I wanted to make sure that that didn't happen. Um, we're looking for preventing it by pexing if we can and being aware of it. The AKC Canine Health Foundation is incredibly grateful to Dr. Rosansky for her work on behalf of the health of our dogs, as well as for taking the time to present this webinar. Thank you to all the organizations and individuals that have supported CHF's Bloat Initiative. To learn more about the Bloat Initiative and to make a secure online donation to support our work, please visit www akcchf.org forward slash bloat. Thank you for your support and thank you for listening.